In this video, we're going to talk about how mathematics assessment can easily get unreliable. The main thesis of this short talk is that if a student has already seen through maybe previous year's assessments or through tutorial questions during the course, uh, the style of questions that are introduced in the assessment, then um, a, an assessment like that may very easily uh, become unreliable. And here I will explain this thesis on a particular example. So imagine we are designing assessment on the concept of an even number. And we have uh, the first question that's displayed here, question one, is 108 an even number? Now, if a student hasn't seen this question before, if the, this is the first time that the student is being asked this question, then I claim that this is a quite a reliable question. Um, but if a student already has seen such question before, then the student, and if a student knows that such type of question might, might occur in, in the assessment, then I claim that this, this question will be very unreliable. Um, at least the answer of the, of the student to this question will be unreliable in terms of determining whether the student understands uh, what an even number is or not. And here is why. Um, so, while preparing for this assessment and knowing that one can't get a question like this, well, first of all, the, the student can easily memorize that uh, if there is a question asking whether 108, that specific number, is an even number or not, then the answer should be yes. But of course, the assessment might not have that exact question. There might be uh, a, a slightly different question where the number is changed to a different one. In that case, the student might still, through internet resources or, or friends, um, uh, kind of prepare for this question without really understanding what an even number is. And let me remind you that an even number is a number that's divisible by two. And uh, one possible algorithm for um, uh, answering this question correctly without knowing what an even number is, is to, to know that uh, when a number um, ends with uh, the last digit being either 0, 2, 4, 8, uh, then the number should be an even number. So knowing this rule, uh, without understanding the concept of, uh, of, it, of an even number, uh, the student will then be able to answer uh, the specific question and all other questions of this kind where this number 108 is replaced with any other number. So a more reliable assessment would be where if I used uh, this question um, in one assessment, then I will not use a similar question in any of the other assessments, so that the student cannot just prepare for this specific question. And then instead I might use uh, for the next assessment, uh, maybe next year, or uh, simply uh, next assessment in the same course, I might use question two instead. Uh, is it true that a whole number times two will always be an even number? Now, knowing the method for the first question, uh, which talks about the last digit, it is possible to still answer this question correctly by examining all possible cases of what the last digit can be, then multiplying uh, that by two, um, if the student understands that the, the last digit, uh, the effect on, on the last digit of multiplying the whole number by two will just be multiplying the last digit by two. And then examining in, in each case, if we have zero, two, four, or eight, when we multiply by two, and I forgot about six before, apologies, when we multiply that thing by two, then we are still going to get a digit that, uh, that is either 0, 2, 4, 6, or 8. So in principle, it's possible to answer this question, but it gets more, more complicated, more difficult to answer this question if um, the, the only thing student knows is, it only has its pre preparation for the first question. Uh, of course, if a student understands what it means to, to have a whole number, uh, sorry, to have an even number, in other words, a number that's divisible by 2, then clearly a whole number times 2, will be divisible by two, so the question can be very easily answered. 
But now if the student has, so, so the, the, the second question is a, is a bit more reliable uh, than the first question after the student already has seen the first question in previous assessment or, or it, uh, as one of the exercises in the course. But now the second question uh, will become easily unreliable if the student already has seen such a question before because for this question the student could prepare as follows. Um, one could just memorize that uh, when the when a question is of this kind, um, where instead of two, we could also have any other number that uh, ends with last digit being either zero, two, four, six, or eight, then the answer um, uh, is always uh, yes to the question. So once again, it's, it's possible to prepare for correctly answering this question without really understanding what an even number is. And so we would, we would want to change this question to another one in the, in the next assessment. So let's say we pick question three now. Um, is it true that the sum of any finite amount of even numbers is always even? And once again, by uh, much longer than for the, for the second question, much longer investigation of cases, one can in principle determine uh, uh, that the answer to this question is yes. Um, but um, uh, that does require a bit more uh, uh, mathematical intelligence and so at that point you assume that okay if a student can do that then most probably the student would have understood the notion of an even number when it was um, uh, given to the student. Uh, on the other hand if the student has seen this question before once again it becomes uh, uh, completely unreliable because for this question one can prepare uh, just by remembering that the sum of uh, any finite amount of even numbers is, is always even. Um, and, and so one just remembers that the answer is yes. So, um, as we see on this very simple uh, example, uh, it is possible to uh, have an ad hoc type of preparation for specific types of questions. Um, and so if uh, a student has already seen that type of question before, then when the student is preparing for the assessment, in, instead of the preparation um, involving the student actually engaging with the content and understanding the mathematics that was being taught, the student simply remembers some ad hoc methods for addressing specific types of questions which the student expects at the assessment. And as long as there is sufficiently many questions on the assessment that, that match with those that the student was expected and prepared for with ad hoc algorithms, the student will be able to pass the assessment. And of course, this pass mark will be quite unreliable because our goal with the assessment was to, in this case, for instance, to, to check whether the student understands what an even number is or not. But because we gave questions that the student has seen before and has prepared for these specific types of questions, uh, the student has methodology of figuring out answers to these specific types of questions without really understanding the concept of an even number. And uh, that uh, shows that, uh, uh, well, at least in mathematics, but probably the same phenomenon is true for other subjects as well, uh, that in mathematics, um, uh, that with assessments it's very important to, um, uh, for the assess assessments to be um, forever evolving, that uh, the lecturer uh, takes very good care that uh, the assessments do not repeat the same style of questions as was asked in, in previous uh, versions of a similar assessment or, or, or that students have encountered throughout the course. Um, and that can get very difficult because um, uh, it, it might be uh, quite uneasy to, um, to, quite challenging to come up always with new types of questions for um, testing a concept. Um, but uh, one, uh, one way of overcoming this challenge is to also let the, uh, the format of assessment evolve as well. Uh, so, for instance, uh, at one, one of the years, the assessment could be exam, at a, at a different year, the assessment could be an assignment in the assignment format, and, uh, and so on. And so, if you let also the format of the assessment evolve, then you have more opportunity for changing uh, the context of your questions, uh, and hence making uh, your assessments more reliable.
So now let's uh, address the, um, the following question. Uh, what uh, impact uh, does uh, do unreliable assessments overall have on, on students completing modules that have a high proportion of unreliable assessments? Uh, so uh, the idea um, uh, is uh, to illustrate uh, the answer to this question on the, on the picture that you see on the screen. Um, so the, the journey um, for re reliable assessments and unreliable ones kind of start at the same spot. The student enters the course and then um, uh, the, the top uh, path is the path of reliable assessments and the bottom one is the path of unreliable ones and I'm going to explain that in a moment. So the reliable assessments force students to climb up the hills of abstraction and then descend down to uh, concrete um, scenarios uh, and th that, that does involve going through certain methods but these methods are uh, methods that students uh, almost by themselves need to develop um, uh, in, in an attempt to apply the abstract to the concrete or in an attempt to abstract away from the concrete. Eventually uh, this uh, allows students to develop application skills and also uh, because of the marriage of the abstract and the concrete in the student's mind uh, then the content knowledge, uh, firm content knowledge is formed and retained uh, once the student exits the course uh, then the student has uh, full, full mastery of the subject, well maybe not full but uh, to some extent has mastery of the subject. Um, and, and that's because uh, each of the assessments uh, uh, forced the student to, uh, to understand what was being taught rather than uh, memorize some ad hoc methods for solving sp specific types of questions that one was expecting on, on the assessment. Now the unreliable uh, assessments take uh, students on a completely different journey um, yes, the student will get some memorization skills as one exits the course because those methods had to be remembered in order to be to be used in the in the assessment. The methods are are, are, are no longer things that student develops by uh, the, him, him or herself. These are more things that students gains from the resources. So the, the, the path um, is, is more flat here. And because of that flat path, um, the interplay between abstract and concrete doesn't really happen. And then uh, those methods, which are actually ad hoc methods uh, that the student learned just for specific types of questions, eventually gets forgotten after exit exiting the course. And so the, the content knowledge um, hasn't been formed, uh, not to mention mastery of the subject uh, um, hasn't been uh, taken place. And so such a student uh, could, could resemble someone who has learned to flow with the, um, uh, with, with, the, uh, with the stream of water flowing in a certain direction. The student isn't really able to swim, just to float and to flow with the water. Whereas in the first case, uh, uh, with reliable assessments, the student has all the skills of being able to fly in, in um, uh, navigating uh, direction of flight uh, and speed and so on uh, by themselves. Um, okay, so um, the, the summary of this is that uh, unreliable uh, assessments uh, also have a, a very significant impact on the experience of the course on, of, on the student and especially developing skills for the course. Uh, and um, I think that many students and lecturers listening to, to this presentation um, will, will be thinking, oh yes, uh, this sounds familiar, because indeed uh, I think it is familiar from both sides because those students who, uh, who perform training for completing unreliable assessments, they, they actually do understand um, that the, the knowledge was ad hoc and, and it, it will be forgotten after, after a while and, and not, not retained. Um, there is of course this feeling of achievement of, of passing uh, uh, a module, um, but uh, they can sense that, that it's, not the, it's not the genuine knowledge that they've gained from this. 
um, and uh, also for the lecturers we we experience this a lot when uh, a student completing certain course maybe even with high marks then enters a follow-up course and then we see that the the the, the, the knowledge and the mastery uh, of the content uh, is actually not there and we're very often we're surprised why why is it not there and so what i'm trying to say is that uh, one big factor for um, for the diversion between these two kinds of um, outcomes um, is uh, um, unreliable assessments. Um, so it, 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 it does mean that one has to take reliability of assessments quite seriously. Um, and of course the, uh, the term that, that is used for this kind of outcome type of um, aspect of assessment is authenticity. And uh, we see how uh, reliability can have direct impact on authenticity as well. Okay, so now we come to the main question. Uh, whose fault is it? Um, is it the student's fault that um, the student um, didn't prepare in the correct way for the, uh, for the assessment, uh, hence making the assessment unreliable? Or is it the lecturer's fault that the lecturer didn't take care to, to make sure that, that, that the questions are, are, are very different from uh, questions in, that students have seen and, and so um, making sure that the assessment will be reliable? Um, well, uh, it, it's not an easy question whose fault it is. And it's not even clear why should there, there be anyone's fault. Uh, there is certainly uh, some pressure on both on the student and on the lecturer. Uh, the pressure on the student is that this module might be one of uh, many different uh, uh, modules within various different courses that the student might be taking. And so there is a time pressure uh, to, to work for everything and especially in mathematics uh, you might not be naturally uh, gifted in mathematics as someone else might be and so it might take you longer to complete the, the tasks. And so it is very easy to imagine that you are kind of almost like forced to just train yourself for the, for the questions that you expect for your assessment, rather than go more thoroughly through the content and try to understand the content. Um, and uh, there is also pressure on the lecturer. Uh, uh, the pressure on the lecturer is, of course, the complexity of, of coming up with new assessments all the time. That can, as we spoke before, it can get quite complex. And on the other hand, demanding of the lecturer to evolve assessments all the time will create another pressure because in many cases, we, we, we must remember that lecturers are also researchers who uh, advance science and uh, they, they don't want to spend all their uh, time uh, working out uh, new questions for assessments. Rather, they want, would like to um, use their creativity for working out new questions in science or maybe solving those new questions themselves. Um, so I think that um, it's nobody's fault. I think that um, um, there are reasons why we, we kind of are tempted to, to follow the path of unreliable assessments. But um, uh, maybe the more correct uh, perspective to put this in is uh, to, to look back and re reflect on whether um, the negative impact of un unreliable assessments has been significant or not. Um, because if, if, if the negative impact was insignificant, then we can just think of this as part of imperfection of life, but we might not be able to perfect. Um, but um, if the uh, negative um, uh, impact of, of unreliable assessments is very significant, maybe we should do something about it. Uh, and, and looking into past, uh, one thing we clearly see is, uh, especially in mathematics, is the uh, loss of interest in the subject. Um, with exciting subjects like computer science, um, 
uh, and many other uh, more uh, um, applicable subjects where students can directly see what will career path be after graduating and so on. Um, uh, that's another factor why my, one might not be interested so much in fundamental science, but keeping in mind that in any uh, type of job you would have to um, apply your, your skills gained at university and the, the type of skills that fundamental sciences uh, develop are irreplaceable and so if you don't gain the skills now then you gain them never. Um, keeping that in mind, um, we, don't, we, we want to continue teaching fundamental science, right? On the other hand, the, the, the students are not so keen uh, on the subject and that, that is clearly visible. There are many cases where a student might have been passionate about mathematics but then changes one's mind. Even at school, there are many pupils who at some point start hating mathematics. Um, and I think um, that is the, the significant negative impact of unreliable assessments. I think that um, the, the school children and the students at, at the university, they instinctively, uh, not just instinctively, maybe also consciously, they see um, that the skills they're gaining through these extensive mathematics courses are not really uh, um, so useful for them. Um, and hence they also then lose the interest because of that. Um, and uh, decline in interest in, in something uh, that forms an important part of our uh, civilization, especially moving forward in the future, we, we, we do want uh, to, be, to be more uh, uh, scientifically literate, to be more mathematically literate because um, of all the technology that we are creating, which eventually is supposed to help us explore the universe outside our own planet and so on. Uh, there is no way out uh, avoiding uh, fundamental science on which all of these uh, technological advances rely, right? Um, so uh, I, I think that lack of interest in, in um, decline in the lack of interest in mathematics, I believe personally it's uh, in most part due to uh, unreliable uh, assessments in mathematics. And um, therefore I think um, uh, it is very important that we do something about it. Um, I don't know exactly what we should do about it yet. Uh, in my own uh, courses, I, I try to do something about it. I try to make the assessments more reliable, but it's also a continuous process where I, every time I discover new aspects of unreliability of my assessments, which I try to fix later on. Um, I think um, it's been... Um, many decades now that assessments have been uh, less reliable than one would, would wish for um, in mathematics uh, around the world and uh, that has it had its impact um, its negative impact and um, to come up with a solution uh, of such a thing um, uh, one, do, one does need um, uh, to experiment and, and to to try things out and to see how they work and uh, one does need to take care in, um, uh, in, in thinking about this problem and, and trying to uh, solve it and with effort from different lecturers and students with the joint effort we can eventually come to maybe some good solutions to the problem. Uh, I think it is the kind of problem where uh, one first needs to put in a lot of work uh, before maybe someone, um, a specific person, will come up and say, "Okay, I've got the bright idea here to to solve to, to solve this problem and take us to a different dimension." Um, such bright ideas uh, are um, uh, are a result of uh, many years of thinking and, and hard work of not just one person but but lots of people. So that is the, uh, the thing I want to uh, conclude this uh, uh, video with, uh, to propose to uh, lecturers and to students to think about this problem of unreliability of assessments and make their uh, input and efforts in um, making the assessments more reliable. Uh, 
uh, with the hope that uh, we can um, change thing, change change the direction, the course of of our uh, education system uh, to a point where, um, because of uh, of reliability and the actual benefit of the, of the assessment, students and students feeling and experiencing that, and of course they will experience once there is benefit, um, then uh, taking a subject like mathematics becomes one of the, uh, one of the pleasure, uh, uh, pleasurable things to do uh, during uh, school years or undergraduate years. Not only for those who might be naturally gifted in that area, but for also for anyone else who would like to take the benefit that uh, studying these uh, subjects offers. And, but of course it doesn't apply only to mathematics, it, uh, these principles apply to other subjects as well. Uh, I just uh, do not have enough expertise to judge to what extent they are relevant in other subjects. Um, so that is the, um, the, the message that was intended to be given in this video. Um, a call for um, becoming more conscious of unreliability of assessments and the impact it has on the experience and the final outcome of of learning and trying to and, and uh, trying to do something uh, about it to eventually uh, accumulate some some knowledge uh, uh, that will en enable us to um, to change the system in such a way that assessments become more reliable and hence uh, the interest in uh, fundamental sciences um, comes back to uh, to students.